Live from Washington, D.C., it's Human Factors Cast! Uh, I guess. I don't know. I, it's something I've always wanted to do, and I guess I did it on the show, but uh, go ahead and roll the intro. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Here are your hosts. Nick Rome and Billy Hall. Hello, Human Factors fans, Human Factors people, non-Human Factors people, hello listeners. Uh, we are here live from Washington, D.C. Well, I'm here live from Washington, D.C. in uh, at the Human Factors and Ergonomics uh, Society annual meeting where nerds get together, uh, but I... Couldn't do this alone, so with me today, I have Mr. Billy Hall joining me hey, over everybody. the phone. Billy, say hi again. I talked over you. That's all right. You oftentimes do talk over me. I feel kind of marginalized. That's okay. We're over the phone. And because he's a masochist, coming back again for the third time on the show, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. What's up, everybody? Back for some more pain. I'm pain. Yes. So, yeah, so I've been here at HFES. Um, how, how have things been going at the homestead? Well, we had a fire. Everything's burning right now. No, I'm kidding. I just in California, so I always assume everything's on fire. This is true. Oh. Nice and sunny. Actually, it's been raining and shit. But anyway, yeah, yeah, I mean, we've had rain. I'm sure there's like fires at work that you're putting out. Hey, oh, oh, <laughs> you may or may not be right. Oh man. <laughs> So what is it like in Washington, D.C.? Did you get me my uh, my Washington Monument, Lincoln Monument, salt and pepper shakers I wanted? I literally have had zero time since I've been here. I've been interacting with uh, other human factors professionals and networking and doing that whole fun stuff. So uh, no, but uh, maybe maybe I can snag one at the airport. I'm not sure if I'll have time. Just a little paperweight, something along those lines. I'm thinking about making a miniature world so I can feel like Godzilla. It'd be amazing. Oh, man. So what is this conference conference again? I know that it's a lot of words that I'm really having trouble understanding. So Human Factors and Ergonomic Society. So it's basically a bunch of people uh, who work on stuff that uh, we talk about on the show. Right. Okay. Like, uh, so you all get together and you draw your magic circles and you summon your dark lords and stuff like that. And you get together and you rub elbows, right? You, you got it. We did that last night and uh, Satan came out. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, oh, it was a pleasant no, no, experience. No, 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 no. No. His name was Satim. Stop being a racist. <laughs> all right. All right. So, so I guess uh, this podcast is going to be a little bit different from our normal format. Um, I'm just going to kind of go over some of the stuff that I have seen here, uh, mm-hmm. some of the cool stuff coming out of the field. I took, like, no joke, you guys, I took 17 notes or 17 pages of notes. 17 um, wow. whole notes. So, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, 17 lines of no, 17 whole pages of notes um, just on all the cool stuff here. And, um, yeah, it's just been an amazing experience so far. And, and uh, to anyone who's who's really considering getting into the field of human factors or human computer interaction or anything like that, it's, I would strongly recommend just showing up one year because the people that you meet here, it's a small field. So you get to networking is tremendously important. And and I've joked about it on the show, like human factors is a bunch of scientists. You know, the the, the uh, conference is a bunch of scientists just meeting and having like show and tell with their posters but i mean i f- i forgot like the critical uh sort of piece of that where it's a bunch of um grad students and postdocs who are running around looking for jobs post-docs? yeah What's a postdoc? uh someone who is working um after getting their doctorate degree oh okay still like kind of in the research field or with a university oh i didn't right. know that yeah so the way you explain it to me, it always seems like it's like a science fair where there's a bunch of tables there and little three panel things laid out and a volcano that bubbles out on top of it. We don't have but, any volcanoes, you know, but we have plenty of other cool things. But I mean, like from what you're making it sound like, it sounds more and obviously it's a lot better than that. Um, but it sounds like it's more of almost like um, like the nerd conventions I like to go to. Like there are uh, less comic books. Stores. 
Well, yeah, obviously less comic books. I mean, let's be honest here. Uh, you can't even find comic books at Comic-Con anymore, but enough about that. Um, so you have like panels and, and keynote speakers and a showroom floor that shows off different research and things like that. And yeah, I would it, imagine seminars where you can participate. Yes. Yeah. So they have, they have like a, a ton of different formats. So they have poster sessions, they have panels that you can attend. They have debate sessions. They have, um, or, or I guess they're not really debate sessions they're kind of like discussion sessions but sometimes they can end up being a debate but uh no they have a ton of different uh ways to sort of express information and and pass that along to the rest of the community um and and so i guess you know i'm just gonna start jumping into these notes and just jump in when you hear something interesting and we can we can talk about it a little bit okay let's do it all right so the first thing tuesday morning um and so, so monday night i got in and we had a gala where we met with, you know, it's a bunch of people who are shy individuals. You just get alcohol in your system and you network as best you can uh, before the week has even started. So so that was Monday. Tuesday, first thing in the morning, um, at what would be, I guess, like 4.30 or, or uh, 5 our time, um, I my my supervisor at work introduced me to Don Norman. Really? Who, yeah. Uh, Don Norman. I heard Billy say who. <laughs> um, Is that like Don Knotts? <laughs> Look at all these ostriches around here. Wrong Don. You know, Don Norman is like a really big deal in our field, especially like a lot of times in your, especially, I don't know about you, Nick, but for my intro class, I had to read his book, like the design of everyday things. Design of everyday what things. Is, yeah. Don Norman. Mm -hmm. Don Norman. He's, he's kind of like, uh, one of the godfathers of, um, human factors. Really, like so kind of like the Wozniak of human factors. You know, funny enough, he did work at Apple. I think he was like VP or something. He was he was something up there. He was very. Yeah, he's, he was really funny about Apple because he's back at UCSD actually teaching in the design lab. He just set up the design lab. Yeah. Yeah, and he he was harping on Apple like some of their designs and stuff recently, and a paper he wrote, and I couldn't even believe it because yeah, he was really high up in Apple at some point. Yeah, oh, and so so it was a real surreal experience having a conversation with Don Norman at about five o'clock in the morning, and he actually he got the President's Distinguished Service Award, um, and and what? that's now yeah, is that the President's President of Human Factor? Or President of Human Factors, Mr. yeah. Obama. No, 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 no. I I haven't seen Mr. Obama since I've been here in D.C. Um, Makes we, sense. It's not like I'm being far fetched here. We stopped by his house and asked if he was home, but uh, he couldn't come out to play. So, so anyway, um, so the first thing, yeah, so that happened, and then we saw the president's speech. Not Obama. This is uh, the human factor. I mean, president. you are in Washington D.C. You got to make that distinction. I, yeah, I feel like I have to. So, so we saw his speech, and and he. So Nick, real quick, is the president still uh, Frank Durso? No, it's Bill uh, Bill Morris, I think. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so he he went into this whole presentation on relevance of human factors in our lives, right? Like how it's important it to important? us. Yeah, yeah. He talked about some of the changes in technology, like how we're socializing more. Like we're doing a podcast over mm -hmm. over the internet right now. Um, you know, uh, phones are a good way to communicate. Um, and, and the way that we gather information. So now instead of going to a library, we just Google it. It's a couple keystrokes away. Like all of, you know, the wealth of knowledge that humankind has, found, you know, <gasps> discovered, it is literally at our fingertips. And this is this, uh, Bill Morris guy. He was, he's kind of like the keynote speaker for your little convention. I mean, your large convention. Mm, he is the president. And then there was a keynote speaker as well. Oh, cool. Who was the keynote? Oh, shoot. I meant to look this up. Um, I might have notes here. I don't... Oh, Norman Augustine. He, uh, I don't know all of his credentials, but they, they literally read off, like, probably what would have been three or five minutes of his credentials. Like, he's a big deal. Um, and he pushes for a lot of, like pro-education messages in uh in congress 
and he's a scientist, he's an engineer. Uh, so, so it was really interesting to listen to him as well. Um, so you're not only just meeting with people who are like doing the same thing you and Blake are and doing your field. You're also meeting people who coincide with your field who are trying to make revelations or um, uh, advancements in your field to bring it to more people, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So human factors is is pretty interdisciplinary. Like you can have engineers, you can have computer scientists, you can have designers, you can have um, UX folk, you can have uh, human factors, psychologists cognitive science uh scientists uh you name it like you can probably fit human factors into it oh that's really exciting so you're getting a lot of different perspectives for this yeah yeah it's yeah it's always a good experience to get these different ex uh, experiences it's always um, a good experience to get different experiences well to get uh, sorry to get different perspectives that's what i meant right 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 um yeah so for sure because i remember like hfes was one of the first conferences i went to and it's interesting to get different perspectives from like your cognitive scientist versus maybe your hfe or human factors engineer and how they just tackle problems going through like the different panels or listening to different talks so it's right. Gonna be an awesome experience. And I mean, it comes down to everybody has different training, so they all approach problems different ways. And when you know one thing works, everyone kind of goes, "Oh, I'm going to take a piece of that and incorporate it into the way I do things." And as like I was talking to Blake about this earlier, it seems like you in your job to be competitive in your field, you have to wear a lot of different hats depending on what kind of projects you take on. Oh, you yeah. know, like you need to know a little bit of programming, you need to know a little bit of this or that. Um, do you feel as two scientists, you know, going into it, this conference, I would also imagine on what you should be looking for in broadening your horizons too. It teaches you like, ah, we got to be a little bit more on the ergonomics. we got to be a little bit more into the engineer based on what's going on. Right. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to keep moving through these cause, uh, I'm you, sorry. you literally stopped me on my first page of notes. So, uh, well, there's so much here. It's there so really is. And, and, and you know what, there was a panel that I went to that was just so phenomenal. We're going to have to do an entire episode on it. Like no joke. Um, I would think we would also should do an episode on these who's who of these people that we're talking about here. Maybe like a little boilerplate of these people. Actually, it's not a horrible idea. Cause I mean, if we're catering to people who really don't know about human factors, like no talking a little bit about Don Norman's work or any of the people you mentioned might not be a bad idea. Yeah. I think it that's would be a... really hard to get us all in that garage. Oh, that's... <laughs> right. we're joined today by Don Norman in our garage. Oh man, uh, yeah, Don. Don is uh, he? He's a nice guy, uh, but I don't think he would have the time necessarily for us. But anyway, okay. So I'm gonna keep going because there's sorry, sorry. Go ahead. No, literally, there is so much to talk about. So, so the president went through and and the overarching theme, I guess, he's like, we need to stay relevant. And, and so we need to take – there's this overarching theme of the entire conference, which is we need to take a human systems approach, which is basically, um, you know, not just the – don't just fix the system. Don't just fix the human. But how can we sort of um, integrate, I, I guess, the two? I don't want to use integrate because there's a whole field called human systems integration, HSI for short. But – that's really the big message is like there's we need to integrate these things anyway i'm gonna keep moving i know it's really interesting and i i honestly feel like we have about five episodes in all these show notes so <laughs> no joke if we want to go back we can um so then norman got up norman augustine and he talked about um sort of you know our interactions with machines um and and how you know he he actually brought up uh, computers are so social actors. Um, oh. and yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyone listening uh, can go back and listen to that episode. And, and they, he brought that up about how we're interacting with machines is differently now. And like the perfect interface would be you talk to a machine and it gives you what you want. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he talked about, there are so many combinations, uh, in the human brain, there's, uh, you know, 10 to the 11th, neurons in your brain and and there are so many combinations in which all those can fire so you have to design something like you can't account for every permutation of those um and so you have to design um you know to to accommodate that thing and he talked about these really interesting things like we're we're um 
attacking different problems now where like we have to really think outside the box and and like one of the things he mentions was like would uh so so we have like these cyborg hearts or whatever and and um you know would you ever thought like five years ago can you network three to four hearts together on the same system i just thought that was really interesting anyway he that's goes like in. a really futurist approach to thinking about problems, too. I mean, that's along, along the lines of, like, Ray Kurzweil and how he talks about oh, yeah. nanotechnology. Wait, yeah. are we talking about, like, hearts like people's hearts? Yes. Oh, that's creepy. Like on a network. Anyway, so he uh, he had a really important message about science in K-12 and K-12 through and how, how that will impact our workforce and how, like, that's really the future. we got to focus on that. Oh, that's um, really interesting. Yeah, so... Then the first panel I went to was me in my virtual environment because, you know, I'm a sucker for that VR stuff. Um, you know, yep, they, we're oh just man. waiting for you to have a lawnmower man moment. Oh, boy. Yeah, so I went to actually all the VR panels that were available just because, oh, you know what? Sorry, I'm going to back up and do a special shout out. Um, so they, they did a, uh, a YouTube contest where it's like uh, how you, um, you know, ex- the premise of the contest was uh, illustrate how human factors is important in our everyday lives. And, you know, they showed these videos. They showed the third place. They showed the second place. And when they showed the first place, I was like... It was our podcast? It wasn't our podcast. It was actually somebody who I went to school with who was in my cohort. So I just want to say congratulations to Michelle Hester. Um, that, that was awesome. And she completely kept all of us in the dark. And so it was a total surprise to just see that... Anyway, so me and my a taste of what she won with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I think she's hiding it on YouTube, but we'll we'll find it and we'll post it because nice. she she deserves yeah. the credit. Uh, no, she uh, she made uh, it was a rhyme. She made like a old old rhyme, like a nursery rhyme, and uh, she did you know those YouTube videos where they actually draw out what's happening on the screen as the narrator is saying something. Oh yeah! Oh cool, cool. Yeah, cool. she I made she made one of those with a rhyme in the background. It was really clever, and uh, I I think it is well deserved. So congratulations, Michelle. Wow, this seems like a really cool thing. So you're doing like education, design, art, medicine, all in oh, one yeah. place. Yeah. All right. So me and my VE, my virtual environment. Um, they talked about um risk in virtual environment. I'm gonna I'm gonna graze over these there i have so many notes on virtual environments they there was a person <laughs> there was a yeah, i know by listening nick definitely sent out a picture of all his notes that he took earlier and it was a lot laid out it, over it my hotel like room it took bed. up a wall of his apartment like some madman's like it's, insanity plan that was that was on on the surface of my hotel room bed like they were all sprawled out um so okay so there was uh, virtual environments where they talked about like how uh, tobacco addiction can be. Um, uh, you can assist with tobacco ad- addiction by showing virtual avatars and um, projecting realism in the face of the avatar and their emotion. Um, they talked about um, team dynamics in the context of gaming, networking challenges. Um, they talked about this cool game that they're making called the Hauntlet, where uh, you're like stuck in a college dorm room. Um, and then they also talked about uh, multiple errands task in the military. Like, oh man, I'm just gonna. I'm okay. All right. <sighs> wow, so much. All right. I oh this <laughs> in that panel in that panel. Uh, just, just by the way, guys, I think we may have a Human Factors cast exclusive scoop. Uh oh. Ooh. All right. So I didn't sign any NDAs, so I can say whatever I want about this. But oh, we're finally learning the truth about the mechs. But no, 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 no. It it has nothing to do with my company. I would never tell you I'm working on mechs. Uh, so here's the thing. So I in this thing, uh, in this virtual virtual environments, virtual reality panel, mm-hmm. they gave mm-hmm. they gave den- demos afterwards. Uh, and I overheard these two guys talking. And so I, you know, said hi. And uh, I looked at their name tags, and they were from Apple. And so... Oh, here we go. The rumors might be true. Right, right, right. And so I asked them just casually, hey, so what are you working on? And uh, they were like, we can't tell you. And I'm like, 
VR is coming to Apple. You heard it here first on Human Factors Cast. <laughs> That's so crazy. That's really awesome. Though. Apple people... VR. Yeah, Apple I mean, VR. I've heard like rumblings of that, but that's cool that they were actually at the conference. They were. Like, is is the idea of the Apple VR going to be like the, the 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 little headset where you put your phone in, or are we talking like a whole VR assist? I don't know. Apparently, they're working on something though. If they sent VR guys, I don't. know. Well, you know, to be fair, they could have just been interested in it, like me. I'm not working on any VR projects right now, but I just went to them all. Um, yeah. So, so that's a disclaimer. You you if. If they don't do VR, you didn't hear it first on Human Factors Cast. But if they did. <laughs> if they totally did. Hear they totally VR. did. But I, I totally think they're going VR. Um, so you heard it here first on Human Factors Cast. <laughs> All right. So up next, let's see here. Man, I, I'm really sorry about my voice, guys. Like, you have to understand that a lot of these things, these networking events, take place in like a, uh, in a very loud room. And so oh, nice. your voice has to elevate and um, basically shouting while you're trying to network. Oh, yep. That's exactly right. And then, you know, you go out for drinks after everything and then you have to shout over people drinking and, and that's networking, by the way, I, I'm just saying it now that's networking. That wasn't, that was work, Billy. That's why I couldn't get your white house. Sure, uh, whatever, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. You just um, suck those. Uh, you just suck those my ties back and just re- forget about your friend who helps you with the podcast every week. Yeah, That's you, cool. I understand. Yeah, Do you hear this, Mike? Burn. By the way, guys, I've missed you because we normally record on Mondays, and this it feels like we've been two weeks apart. But anyway, uh, but this is really good because like I, I didn't get to go to the conference this year or whatever, so I'm, all, I'm stoked to hear that it's been so great. I would have gone oh, to the it's been wonderful. conference too, but I just want to go to Washington, D.C., to be honest with you. Oh, it was wonderful. <laughs> um, so then after that virtual environments, I went to a uh, – oh, man. And this this was the coolest panel I went to was Have the – Have we not uh, heard that about every panel he's Yeah, no, every no, 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 no. Every single one of it. No, no, like no, no, a, no, 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 no. He's like Augustus Gloop in a candy shop. I like the chocolate of the VR. Okay, okay. So I like all the panels. Like I li- – I, well, I liked all of them. Um but this one, this one was the coolest one. And I took so, I took like five pages of notes on this one. So, um, just, just by the We're way. We're still on Tuesday, by the way. <laughs> but that's true. <laughs> yeah, we are. We are still only on Tuesday. Um, and we are recording this on a Thursday night. So, uh, so yeah, we got like two and a half days to go. All right. So, so this one. <laughs> This one will be easy, though, because I'm just going to say the panel was uh, Deep Space Exploration, and it had... Oh, yeah. We're going to get some Star Trek on. So not... who did you have, like, I don't know if it's companies or if it's people, but were there, in, like, really interesting speakers? Yeah. So for this one, um, they had the director uh, for the International Space Station on the panel. Wow. wow. Is he that guy on the YouTube videos that plays a guitar and is from Canada? No, that's Chris Hadfield. That's a Canadian oh. astronaut. No, this is the director for the ISS. So he actually like sets up all the missions and um you know, he's he's on the ground. He he's never gone to space. But there was also an astronaut on the panel who has gone to space and I got to shake her hand afterwards. Uh, nice. and it was a female astronaut, which is awesome. Um you know, and and, and yeah, I, I got to shake her hand. I shook somebody's hand who has left this earth. How cool is that? That's almost unbelievable, to be honest. I know. I yeah, it was it was amazing. Um, but I am not gonna go into this panel only because we have five pages of notes on this, and this literally is an entire episode. And I want to like this content is just so juicy. I'm gonna save it. We're gonna we're gonna do an episode on this. I think. Um, on space on on the human factors of deep space exploration oh yeah there we go oh nice oh yeah 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 yeah. it's it's some good stuff um so after that was done um you know i i I went to a poster session this is this is where everybody does their whole uh you know show science work. fair yeah a science fair science fair but these are always so much fun because there's people showcasing what they're doing currently with their research and i don't know i always get a kick out of that maybe that's the scientist in me now yeah. you can't show stuff that you're secretly working on that's like privileged information on there right not Usually, secret information no. 
it's like a lot of times it's university stuff or it's like open propriety or it's stuff or, that people want to be picked up by a company or right? this public is also domain. a place where people can go hawk their wares right uh, there, there are vendors there, but they yeah. don't do posters generally. Um, no, this is, this is stuff that's like, yeah, out there, public domain. Um, and oh, okay. I saw a lot of cool ones. I'm, I'm just going to kind of briefly go over them. Um, I saw there was a lot of them on like healthcare applications. Uh, there were a few on cool. video games, um, like Starcraft and, uh, there was, really? yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I was know. it a study on StarCraft or to how to make a better StarCraft? It was uh if I'm recalling correctly, it was about how um how expert users utilize the keyboard. Oh, I see. So it was more of like it, it like this stuff is more like studies. Like I'm thinking like it's like an inventor's fair type of thing. Oh no, this is like this general is, research that yeah. people are doing. Oh, I see. And so how it applies to HF. Wow, it's almost like Okay, so it's kind of like that. Everyone's showing their research project, like the old school, like Philosophers of Rome style. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Okay, I get it. I get it. Okay, go on. They had a, they had a really cool poster on uh, this augmented reality sand table that like uh, the military can use to help plan their courses of action. I thought that was really neat. Um, basically, the sand table readjusts to the topographic map and they project on top of it uh so that way they can see like the elevation and their path oh it's so cool oh so that's like actually making almost like a live war board or something yeah well it's more topographical he won't they won't put like people in villages on there like they've seen gotcha. the sci-fi stuff. they could project it though um yeah so that's yeah, it's really cool. Um, I didn't stick around too much, but I I did talk with the uh, the person who was at the poster for a little bit about it, and then I also um, went and saw. Did Pan. they have a demo of the board? No, th there's not enough room here. It's literally just pictures of it uh, okay. um, on the poster. Which I mean, you know, I would love to see this thing. But that sounds amazing. Um, mm -hmm. Then there was another one on virtual teamwork. There was a ton of them. Those ones were the ones that I kind of thought were uh, cool to me. Uh, there were a lot of them that would have been cool to other people as well. But uh, for me, those those were the ones that were kind of my highlights. So just out of personal interest, would yeah. you like tell us a little bit about the uh, virtual teamwork one? Because like telecommunication is something I'm super interested in. Yeah, so... Um... From, from what I remember, um, and I, I really don't want to misrepresent what these people on the posters, and, and this is kind of why I'm glancing over it too, is because I don't want to misrepresent what they found. Um, but uh, this was more of like a lit search um, where... Okay. Yeah. Lit search? Yeah, so... Like kind of where they... Yeah, Nick, you can take that one. Yeah, so a lit search is, is basically when you go through and uh, kind of dig through what everybody else in the field has done on this topic. So that way it's kind of like um, – so, so you know how uh, articles are published, right? It's like a single article. Right. It's almost like taking all those articles and saying, okay, I've – done the massive task of looking at all of these articles and summarizing the results into one thing. Um, it's, it's kind of like the consolidation of, uh, knowledge, if you will. It's often how you'll start your thesis too. Like if you're interested in a specific topic, reading all the literature you can or doing like a literature review will help you decide how to make your own study. Oh, I get this. People actually hire a lot of people in law and business librarians. They hire librarians to actually collate this data so that they can cross reference it and stuff like that. So if you need to know about ice cream laws, they have all the ice cream laws and papers published about ice cream laws. I make sense is what I'm saying. I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what the um, what the authors of this poster uh, basically came up with was uh, again, I don't, I don't want to butcher this, but I, I think it was like a list of all the different ways in which we communicate. And, um, oh, geez, I, I'm completely drawing a blank on what it was. Um, I did, I did connect with uh, one of the people on the poster though, so. I, w I will well, double I will follow up and I will I will get that poster to you I think yeah I don't sure yeah 
Well, I want to make a note, especially to everybody who's listening about this. This is your experience, and this isn't a singular experience, singular experience where you're th- seeing a bunch of different conferences and things that you are really interested in, working yeah. on yourself and otherwise. So, I mean, I think we should all just put that disclaimer that you are not an expert on what you saw. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, these were you just things that-, that I found interesting, um, and, and uh, you know, like when you're out there, you only see the stuff once, and and usually what you do is you connect with these people and say, hey, can I, can I, you know, grab a copy of your poster? I'd love to, like, see what you've done and, um, you know, potentially use it in your own research. Absolutely. Um, so, so okay, so that was Tuesday. That was uh, the first real day of the conference. We're 30 minutes <laughs> in. Wow, we're 30 minutes into the podcast. I pro- and, and I skipped like a big one. I skipped the deep space exploration one. Wow. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so Wednesday. Uh, mm-hmm. Oh, man. This one you was You woke really... up hungover because you were partying hard with all your nerd friends. Yeah, we, were, <laughs> uh, we were networking, uh, I think is the oh, correct I'm term. Oh, i yeah, we were... That's a technical term for it. Oh, we were... that's, not like, that's what LinkedIn's really for, drinking buddies. <laughs> we, we were networking. I, uh, I rolled out of bed at what would be 4 o'clock our time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, uh, I, I rolled out of bed, though, because I wanted to go to the second virtual environments um, one. And this one, um, oh, man, I'm like 50-50 on this one, whether or not it was my favorite of the virtual environments ones yeah. that I went to. Um, because I went to another one today that was just, oh, it was phenomenal. And, oh, oh man, we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay, so this one, <laughs> uh, this one... Um, talked about like immersiveness in 360 degree video so like um basically can you get uh let me look over my notes really quick to make sure i don't butcher what they said um basically what they were saying was can you do you still get the same amount of presence in a 360 degree video um versus like a directed view uh, video. So, like for example, if you were to watch a video, and the the sam- the uh, example they used here was a six minute video of the International Space Station floating, right? And and it would have different call outs, and it would tell you auditorily like what what these parts of the International Space and all these interesting facts. Um, and is that any different from watching a? Um, so the fact that you're like floating in space in virtual reality, looking at this thing, does that have an effect on whether or not you absorb that information versus if you were to just watch it like on a YouTube video mm-hmm. and, um, and kind of like, uh, see what the director wants you to see. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, the idea of it is one of the appeals of virtual reality is, you know, I'm looking at this microphone right now, but I can't see what's on the other side of this microphone. In a virtual reality, I could. You yeah, could, that's you interesting because it. now you're letting people interact with their environment. So supposedly that would make you more engaged. So maybe you would gather more information. Well, or or well, what were they arguing? Well, to be fair, uh, they were arguing that presence influences uh, the amount of knowledge that you um retain about whatever you watched um and and yeah, you know that, that their their main finding was that presence which is um the feeling that you are actually there so the people who watch this video if they were high on presence they would feel like they're actually floating in front of the international space station right like it feels real to them wow. um so presence hindered uh their ability to uh recall information so it doesn't actually help but oh so it's actually the inverse of what i said yeah oh that's really interesting and and it makes sense right if you have a directed view if you have a video where it actually points it out to you the thing is in a in a 3d video or a 360 video like you can look in any direction and miss miss content like it's still playing so you can look away from the international space station and it's still playing and you just miss it um, I mean, that makes sense also, too. I mean, you think about it, I'm more caught up in where I am and what I'm doing, tricking my head into believing that, which is the goal right. of virtual reality. And but, it's interesting It's interesting that you say that, too, because, yes, presence hindered their information recall, but mm-hmm. it also increased their interest in the topic. So 
Hmm. So, and and that may be more important in the long run, depending on what the topic is. Um, but you know, obviously, they need to replicate it again and well, again. Well, we've actually seen this in work. Like prime example of it was that uh, book sales when the movie Titanic came back out in the '90s. Book sales and movies and TV shows about the Titanic went up like 200% in selling and buying it because of the idea of tangential learning. You know, hmm. we experience something, we like something, even it has n something so vaguely to do with the topic at hand, we immerse ourselves in the topic. Oh, that for sure, for sure. Sense, yeah. um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to move on because I've been, I've been spending way too much time on this. Uh, so the next we're guy... We're not on him enough. <laughs> we're, no, we're, we're really <laughs> just not going to get through everything awesome. unless I keep... We want to move on. It's about me, guys. No, really, like, we're just not going to get through everything unless I push us through. Um, <laughs> so the next guy up talked about virtual shadows, which is basically an uh, augmented reality uh, heads-up display. Uh, he mentioned Pokemon Go. And this, okay, uh, by the way, go listen to our first episode on Pokemon Go. We kind of we kind of did our thoughts on it. But uh, this, this poor guy who got up to the screen, like, he kept dropping really expensive equipment, and it was really painful to watch. And, and Oh, no. This, this guy's a champ. He just, he plays it off. He's like, sorry, I'm a really clumsy presenter. Um, like, he just played it off. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, what this uh, virtual sh shadow concept was, was it's a basically a, um, it's a heads-up display in a car that sort of, projects a uh, pedestrian's pathway as he cro he or she passes uh, or crosses a street. And so it can um, tell the car to speed up or slow down based on the, uh, the pedestrian's trajectory, which is interesting. Um, he talked about some considerations and, uh, you know, and, and the, the main takeaway was that augmented reality can show the most important elements uh, like, you know, if the car is going to hit a pedestrian, but it does distract from other elements like what else is going on in the environment. So I, I just thought that was interesting. Well, I mean, that's what's going on in a lot of the literature with HUDs or heads up displays, right? Is they're they're cool and they present good information, but they like especially in a car, they're really distracting. Like BMW's done studies on that itself. That's why a lot of cops put the kibosh when they were just, you know, Google Glass and they would pull people over using it. Right, right. Um, uh, let's see. Another another guy talked about live action versus uh, vir virtual reality training, um, mass Ooh. casualty training. So um, this would be like in a disaster zone. So like an earthquake is the one that they use. So you know, does are you able to get the same amount of knowledge and training from a virtual um, system for the, rather than an expensive in real life system? Um, and the answer is yes, with the caveat that, um, oh, let's see here. Uh, both groups learned as much as the other one did. Um, and well, see, that's interesting going back to the point we just brought up, like talk, talking about the immersiveness of the presence. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I mean, you convince yourself that you're in a mass casualty situation because well, you see the horrors of it. Let me say this too. This was this was not this was a virtual environments panel, so this wasn't actually VR. This was literally just sitting at a computer playing a game. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. I see what you're saying. So, so uh, let's see. It's uh, both groups learned as much as the other one did, uh, but um, the preferences or the perceived effectiveness uh, had no effect on the way they learned. So they actually thought that the virtual reality system or the, that the virtual environment system, they thought that it was going to be less effective. Um, oh. And they, they had a preference for the real environment, but that had no effect on, on what they learned. What would it be? It would be the idea that both of them work equally well. So go with the cheaper alternative. Yeah, but you also have to consider like the participants who were in this study. They they didn't they didn't like they they didn't they didn't think it was effective and they preferred the live action. But you know it is it effectively is the same thing. Um, and if you're interested in this, this is the VCAST V C A E S T was the uh, training that they that they received. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next one here. Testing of uh, oh yeah, so this this one was really interesting to me. Um, this guy 
proposed the need to uh, have Fort a speed. No, he Sorry. had a he had he proposed this need for a test to identify whether or not you are in a virtual environment. So this. Okay, this okay, let, oh, let this goes back to like to the brain in a bat philosopher's question. That's yes. Oh but, yes. Yes. Explain that to me real quick. So there's That's interesting to me. So, so Oh it's, so like there's there's a thought that maybe we're not actually humans. We're, we're in a so simulation or something. It's being mess around with electrodes. You ever heard of that? Oh I've heard of that. Well yeah. then the guy who's messing around with my brain is really a dick. Yeah. <laughs> so so um he 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 went through and said basically we need this because virtual reality is becoming more available to consumers there's free software to create content technology is yeah. always advancing um it's becoming more and more similar to reality and it's cost effective training tool like there's there's a ton of reasons why we need this right and some of the measures that he was saying was presence what we just talked about right like uh can you effectively judge whether or not you're in reality? Um, he also talked about embodied condition uh, or cognition, sorry, uh, where um, you're, you're actually walking in a virtual environment versus using a keyboard. Uh, he talked about neuro ergonomics, which oh, uh, wow. That's I think a term I have not heard in a long time, right? We're talking about ergonomics next week, aren't we? Yeah, that's on the list for next week for ergonomics. All right, all right. So, um, so that's uh, that's basically are the brain waves similar? Like, in, if you're in a virtual environment, are the brain waves that the that you're experiencing or that you produce are they similar to what you produce in real life? Um, and then he also talked about measures on boredom. Like, virtual environments shouldn't be boring. Um, there's this need for it to be engaging in some way because, um, you know, it, it will, it's going to be used as a tool or a recreation thing. And so you're not going to want it to be boring. Um, he also compared this to the Turing test, which is, uh, can you identify whether or not an artificial intelligence is an artificial intelligence or if it's a human, Right. And once the artificial intelligence fools a human into thinking it's a human, then it's past the Turing test. Oh, that's incredible. So is he basically getting at virtual environments being able to pass as an actual environment? Yes. Yes. That's, that's what he's. Incredible. Yeah, it was it was really interesting. Um, yeah. Where the artificial virtual reality system is perceived as real. Yeah. Um, that's he, what the Turing test is. No, the Turing test is: uh, Can you distinguish an artificial intelligence agent as an artificial? Oh, right. I know this one. We talked about that when we were talking about a little bit of uh, computers as social actors. Yes, you got it. Um, yeah, he talked about. I gotta, I gotta keep moving. Uh, but he talked about flow, um, and and flow. Just a brief overview of flow, because I can't. We could do a whole episode on flow, and we probably should at some point. But flow is basically, you know, when you're in the zone when you're playing a game mm -hmm. or, and you just get lost in it, that's flow. Um, that's, that's the best I can, I can describe it, but no, it makes sense. So is that like uh, flow states is, or is that something completely different? That might be, that might be in there. Um, but uh, let's save flow for another episode. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> there's so much with flow that we could, but this next one actually was on flow um, and it was flow on game based training. Um mm. And uh, this guy, oh, this guy was really cool. He worked for uh, the U.S. Army uh, Research Lab. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was basically, this one was basically, uh, can't, his question was, to what degree do you need a virtual agent for tutoring in a game? So, like, for example... Um, take okay. a, take a game where you are, I, this game that he mentioned was TC three sim, which is like a teaching, um, you know, it helps you make decisions under fire and helps with, um, deciding who to triage in a combat zone. They say it's a game, but I mean, it sounds pretty brutal. Uh, <laughs> Like, yeah, that sounds like that. I mean, that sounds like real life training. Almost. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to try that out, kind of. So, so see if I have the stomach for it. You see know, what it takes. Yeah. So, so anyway, he was he was basically saying like, so so they're playing this game, and when they either make a mistake or something, a tutor says something. So in one condition, they were like, 
they they use the voice of God. So all they did was say, oh, you should probably do this, right, instead of that. And then in another condition, they used this, uh, like an, a virtual avatar in the game, right? So, uh, like a clippy or like someone over your shoulder? No, like like another U.S. Marine Heard walks up to you. Trouble sewing on this leg. Would you like help? No, clippy. Going <laughs> clippy. By. Oh no. Uh, if if Sorry, you guys if you guys like Clippy, like our like and subscribe. Um, <laughs> give us a like for Clippy. Uh, so. <laughs> No, and then the other condition was, uh, yeah, so you'd have the virtual avatar come up and tell you, uh, so another Marine would come up and tell you, you should probably do this. Um, and then uh, the last condition, the, c the control was obviously just playing the game with no feedback. And then, and then the last condition, they made this um, generalized intelligent framework for learning or GIFT. Uh, and, and, uh, it's called GIFT. It's called GIFT. Uh, and and uh, so... What this was was basically an external sort of thing. So this was a um, like a not like a pop up, but you'd run it in a browser off to the side, and this did not impede their flow at all, and it actually did better than anything else, and um, or did as good as anything else. And and the the key takeaway is that it's easy to implement. I got to move on. We're we're getting pretty tight on time here, but. Uh, I went to a panel on expert decision making and basically how like um, analysts make decisions and how they're talking about like you have uh, you have intuition and you have intuition is like your idea about something and then you have this insight they're talking about like a criminal case right so like if you have you have pre preliminary data of like a car break in or something you have that intuition that it is you know linked maybe to something else and then mm -hmm. once you finally arrive at the end game you have insight right you know you you know what happened um but you have to make that leap of faith like in assassin's creed like just just you have to make that leap of faith on sort of this concept um i i am not doing it justice I, I really am not um I like I was scribbling down notes. I got to I got to keep moving through these you guys. I'm sorry. Uh they talked about anchoring and laddering and associations with uh Oh wow. So that's getting a lot to like the Tversky and Kahneman research with all the decision making stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. What is that? Uh Blake, you want to take this one? Yeah, so that Tversky and Kahneman did a lot of research just concerning how people make decisions and uh -huh. specifically what biases we are introduced to. So, mm -hmm. like, and they talk a lot about how our own biases influence the way we perceive things. Oh, I see. And kind of how, like, I look at an a Mac Apple computer and I'm like, this is a piece of trash. And some people will look at an Apple computer and be like, this is a work of art. Just as a note, he's looking at my Apple computer It was right just now. an example. But yeah, similar, similar to that. I mean, you have some kind of thing that you are used to or whatever, so you lean towards making decisions. Like you know, Don that. Norman. <laughs> Don Norman worked for Apple. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so it was really interesting. You talked about anchors and how that's, like, your starting point. Um, and, and you, uh, make these links between your anchors and the data that you have available. And then, um, you ask these associate associative questions kind of to like whittle down or narrow down the commonalities between these anchors. Um, basically a long, long way of saying you have all this information, um, you are linking together this information and you are whittling down, like there, these questions are designed to like weed out what is not connected uh it was kind of cool um i gotta move on let's see here uh let's talk about uh, there was a thing on cyber defense um there was a thing on so this this was really cool so the, at the end of my day yesterday on wednesday i went to a uh, a work function um for uh for pacific science and engineering and um because uh, one of our colleagues, Harvey Smallman, got inducted as a fellow uh, for HFES. And a fellow is uh, someone who's made a lot of contributions to the uh, human factors field. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and so we we had a celebration for him. Oh, that's great! Congratulations for him. Congratulations to Harvey Smallman uh, for being a fellow. Um, and and uh, it, so so we went to dinner. And I'm sitting there, and I'm talking with people, and up walks this guy um, who I've seen before, and I know his face, and I'm like, oh. And and we've said his name before on the show, too. And I'm like, oh, what is Chris Wickens doing here? Oh, shoot. The Wiccan man himself. That's so awesome, man. So Chris Wickens comes, and he sits <laughs> down. And he has a conversation with Harvey and uh, one of one of the uh, professors that I worked with in in my graduate career at the University of Idaho, uh, Stefan Werner, and and I was included on this chat. So it was me, Harvey, Chris, and Stefan, and we were all just talking. And I I had a real pinch me moment when Harvey started bringing up board games. Board we know that's games. His favorite thing, man. I- that's so crazy. And Told you that was a podcast. Yeah, and we just recorded this podcast a couple weeks ago. And so, uh, you know, I was sitting there and I was like, pinch me. Am I really talking about board game design with Chris Wickens right now? Like, is that a thing? Am I really doing this? It was it was just amazing. It was pretty you, cool. You promoted our show, right? And told I, him to listen? I did. Well, I didn't tell him to listen, but I did, I did say, you know, what's really interesting is that I just did a very surface level analysis of, of board game design on a podcast that I do. Epic. You so go here and listen to it. Oh <laughs> man, it was it was it was awesome. He stuck around for a couple hours, and and we uh, we all had a good time. Um, so then that's t- great, man. Meet your heroes. Yeah, like uh, wow, networking has been phenomenal this this time around. <laughs> it sounds like it, man. I'm so stoked for you. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, so that was uh, a good way to end my Wednesday. So that was yesterday. Hmm. Then we got some stuff today. Um, let's see here. So I attended a thing on proactive decision support, uh, and the theme there was context, right? You need to take sort of some con. You need to consider what context is around you um, in order to uh, provide enough information for people to um, make correct decisions. There's a lot there. Uh, proactive decision support should be its own episode. I'm I'm gonna skip it for now. The last sort of interesting thing, and this 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 was uh, this took place just a couple hours ago, and I had a ton of fun in this panel. Um, and it was a panel on. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. What you got? Esports. Really? Esports at he, at the Human Factors Conference. That's awesome. What was it about? There was a well esports. It was a panel on electronic sports. Um, and uh, oh man, this was. Is this... it about engaging the audience? Because that's one of the things that esports has always run into as a problem. No. So there's uh, this this panel. This panel was really interesting, and I stuck around for about half an hour talking to the panelists afterwards. Because a uh, friend of the show, Zyrene, uh, who works at Riot, he uh, he's a friend of the show, and we know he's in the industry. And so it, it was always just it's good to talk with you know. Uh, about what's going on, and that's that's kind of my window in, and it's it's very one sided, and so I, I like to get other perspectives. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, they this one was this one was cool. So you know they talked about like what esports is, and we should probably break that down just really quick. And it's basically uh, electronic sports, um, like League of Legends or Dota or uh, Starcraft Two or um, well, oh, what are some of the other ones out there. I guess Overwatch is kind of picking up steam with that, and then oh, yeah. Halo. There's a various amount. There's a lot of them. It's basically competing in games, uh, mm-hmm. and so you know they were talking about how like there's a lot of issues right now with how teams communicate and how they are processing information, um, you know, and then there's issues with like uh, human computer interaction, you know, and and uh, uh ergonomic design right because they're using these keyboards and and they showed this video of the starcraft player going a million miles a minute and like every action was intentional but they were moving over the keyboard and i was like wow if you think what we do is wizardry take a look at a starcraft (laughs) 2 player like that that is in insane 
Yeah, it's like sheer magic watching some of that stuff. It really oh, is. Yeah. They yeah. have to hone their whole bodies for stuff like that. And StarCraft oh, yeah. II, StarCraft II especially, is really interesting because, um, you know, there's there's a there's this resource management component to it and, along with everything else, and it's just one player versus one player. And it's, it's just amazing. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, uh, no, the first guy up, he... Um, he was talking about education and how uh, how sort of these esports teams on college campuses can help affect academic performance, right? Like that's that's always the question when they get these clubs on campus: is how is this helping my students? Yeah. So what was the argument here? So um, you know, it was really interesting because like uh, being in a club. Uh, can teach you about marketing if you're on like a YouTube or Twitch stream. Mm-hmm. It can it can teach you about it can teach you like how to use computers, um, and you know some of the main like it can teach you a lot of stuff was his message and and some of the stuff that uh, that I took away from this was that you know obviously the more hours of video games that you play, the worse your grades get. Like that's no secret. We've studied that. We know this. Yeah, but um, that's anything that's not actually studying and doing your grades. Yeah, but people like to pick on video games. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, hours played up, grades go down. Um, but but you can mitigate uh, that hours played statistic um, by by creating a positive club experience. So if, if somebody has had a positive club experience, i.e. they have found a team that they like, they have found friendship, they have... Um, contributed something that they feel is special in the club uh then uh-huh. it doesn't matter that you're playing a lot of hours because you're technically just doing it with friends and you know it you're learning something from it i guess that that was the takeaway it was really cool it was really cool um yeah so that's what you took today what else did you do well oh so there's there's more with this esports one. Oh, uh, okay yeah Great. yeah yeah, uh, so there was esports on interpersonal relationships, like how how teamwork can help you accomplish goals together, um, how it gives you emotional satisfaction from working together with people as a team. And I thought of us. I was like, man, we we work together as a team every week to pull out this podcast, and right. we we play together online too. Um, and uh, you know, it 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 offers uh, an opportunity for self improvement, um, and. Uh, you know, things like friendship and empathy, you know, when you lose you or when you beat somebody else, you empathize with them because you've lost yourself and you know what that feels like. Um, so I mean, it makes sense, too, because it's like uh, you're it's almost a different level of social interaction and connection. Because I remember when I moved away from the south, I used to just play video games online with all my homies. So it's a way of staying connected. Right. What yeah. is the distinction? Is there any distinction between everything we've talked about in esports and just doing other things in that interaction of sports? Is there a distinction between that and esports? So sports itself has been studied, but esports has been largely untouched because it's brand new, right? In the last couple of years, it's like doubled every year. So it's getting bigger and bigger and uh it you know, there's there's this negative stigma towards video games and so what their what their message is is it's not all bad guys come on mm-hmm. uh then um then a pro gamer came up and gave his two cents which was uh he he did a he did a pan or he did a presentation on um measuring cognitive abilities in video games right like can video games be used to test people and he brought up this really cool concept of stealth assessment where um and that just sounds really cool right stealth assessment yeah stealth assessment sounds like that's cool assassin that's building in a test into a video game without them realizing that it's a test Mm. because Mm -hmm. then you there's a bunch of things associated with tests right you get anxiety you get uh, your performance might degrade all this thing all this stuff so so uh he he actually built some portal maps um and he he made some portal maps to test people and um it it correlated with a lot of things and and his his takeaway was that you know it might not correlate 100 percent but we can get an idea and it's very preliminary in his research and and it's um it's a good start, 
And we need to start looking at things like this to see how we can use this data that's being collected by video game companies and uh, and and use it in a positive way. Uh, wow, I yeah, feel like I, mean, I... That, that's really cool because I mean, there's been a lot of research of how video games and playing video games x amount of hours before you hit a threshold really enhances your spatial ability, so your ability to de detect things quicker than others and all that kind of stuff. So it's cool they're going into research more about like how it can help you learn. Right, right. So. So that's all I have on my notes, but, uh, man, it's, it's been a phenomenal experience and, um, just amazing. Do you guys have any other last questions before we wrap this sucker up? Well, yeah, I do actually. I mean, like you've been running around with these different types of series. Uh, personally, what do you feel that you gained from this conference? What do you, is there any new avenues you actually want to perform, uh, pursue in your professional field? Is there anything that you want to get more into anything that took you out of your comfort zone yourself. Nothing that took me out of my comfort zone. Um, but definitely things that, uh, we don't have a very strong virtual reality presence at, uh, where I work. And so I, it has reinvigorated my drive to push for, uh, new frontiers in there because it's going to be the future. We work a lot with the Navy and there's a document that states how the Navy is going to operate at 20 in 2025. And, and, you know, like this is, this is the future. It's, it's gotta happen. And I want to be at that forefront and, and make it happen. Okay. Well, thanks for very much for having us, Nick, and telling us all about this great conference. I know there's so much news from it, but I think we're going to be able to get a lot of great, shows out of it i think so too yeah like i said we have a ton of uh show notes to go through but that's that's got to be it for today if you want to be featured on the show we're all over social media go ahead and comment on our soundcloud facebook or twitter sorry i'm tired <laughs> send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com with all your questions you can also get to the front of the line uh by supporting us on our patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast be sure to like, subscribe, and review us on iTunes, the Google Play Store, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast directory. We're always trying to keep in touch with interesting topics that you guys want to hear about, like any of the ones that we talked about today on the show. So feel free to suggest a way. I want to thank Blake for being on the show uh, and helping Billy out while I'm away. Where can our listeners find you, Blake? As always, you guys can find me on Twitter at UXChillBro. As always, thanks to my co-host, Billy Hall. Where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter or streaming on YouTube at Comstar Cleric. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn, sneak in an invite while I'm networking, or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast, and until next time, it, it depends! depends.